this theory was developed from the work of um, <clears throat> a psychologist called um, John Gottman, and um, he called it the San Marital model. And then I have called this the San Marital theory. I love this because I mean, I've seen a lot of information out there on marriage and on relationships. I love this because of it's done based on a lot of research. For him to develop this, he actually got a lot of people together. <clears throat> I have, um, <clears throat> he got couples together. Not only did he give them questionnaire to assess their relationships, but he put them, um, they did research and um, from their research, they um with couples they put couples in a house and you know watch their interaction like they would put them in the house for two weeks so not only did they and then they followed couples up for years for five years from the beginning to see you know how certain traits they saw at the beginning of their relationship how those traits affected whether they stayed in marriage or they didn't stay in marriage and um, from their study, they were able to predict almost by 95% the couples that are likely to get divorced and couples that are likely to stay married because of certain parameters that they saw. And they now developed this theory from that parameter that when they saw certain things in these couples, the likelihood of them separating or divorcing was extremely high. Some of these indices were almost like 95%. And so based on that, they developed the San Marital House theory. Um, now I have adapted the theory, you know, um, and um, I'm going to be looking at it from the scriptures actually, from the Bible. And um, the reason I would say to you, the San Marital House theory really resonated with me was because it kind of um, collaborated with some of the things we to first say true wisdom is a house built and by understanding it is established and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches for me this is the foundation of the sound marital house theory the sound the marital the marriage is like a house that you are building and you are building and it's not just a house that you build and you stop building and you move into it and that is the end. It's like a house that is constantly being developed. And it says that one, you have to build this house through wisdom. And then it's it then you've built it, but it has to be established. So many of us have built a marriage, but is that marriage established? And then is are the chambers filled with precious and pleasant things? And so there are three steps. And so please just you know, uh, join me in, in this journey. There are three steps to an enriching marital relationship. The building, the establishing, and the feeling. Take note of that, the building, the establishing, and then the feeling. Many of us get stuck in the building and never get to the level of establishing. And then some of us establish, we've established our relationship, we are okay but it's not beautiful. It's established. We have a relationship. We are all okay, but it is not really beautiful. You know, the, it's not, um, it, it's, we, we, we live different lives, but the real marriage that God desires, and that is where I want to get to. That is where I want to see people get to. That is my desire. I prayed a prayer when, from years back. I said, Lord, I want to see what you had in mind in the Garden of Eden when you gave Eve to Adam. I want to see that in people's lives. I want to see that in my own life. That is to me. I want to see what you have in mind and teach me how to move in that realm and help move people in that realm. And that was when I got the scripture. That three steps, house is built, is established, and it is filled. We, we try to build, and we get to the level of establishment. 
through building, we need wisdom. You cannot build a relationship without wisdom. Because I'm sure for those that have been married for a long time, you know that it's not everything you see you talk about. There are many times you have to play mute. It's not everything you react to. You have to be wise in what you respond to. You have to choose your battles if you want that home marriage to be built. Now, it is established through understanding. So you have wisdom of what to say and what not to say. But if you want to establish a strong relationship, it is also by understanding. I used to teach this when I still used to teach about a relationship. I said, you have to, your spouse must be your specimen in your lab. You know, when you want to learn about cockroach, when we were in the biology lab, you will dissect the cockroach. You cannot imagine, imagine dissecting a cockroach, dissecting the leg, the intestine, everything as tiny as a cockroach is in order to understand what is in the cockroach, how the cockroach moves, how the cockroach reacts, what, how, it how it releases those horrible scents. You have to spend time in the laboratory, in your science laboratory to dissect and you have to do it gently in order to understand the cockroach. It's the same way that marriage is established through a time of understanding. It is not the wife understanding the husband alone or the husband understanding the wife alone, but for it to truly be filled with precious things. It has, there has to be an understanding, choosing to, to, to see your spouse as your research subject, as a study in which you will have to take a step back and do like this. And you study what, you know, why does this person react this way? What makes this person laugh? What they make this person hungry? What makes this person smile? Marriage is not about, oh, the wedding, and then they live happily ever after. It is, it is, it is a process, a work process. And then after that level of understanding, now you have understood the person. It says, by knowledge shall the chambers be filled. That understanding will now lead to knowledge of how. So I've understood you. Now, but how can I make that understanding of you help me to be able to get the best out of you, to be able to bring the best out of you? So understanding is still not good enough. Some people say, yes, just understand your spouse. It's not good enough. It is good. But from understanding, there's a next level of knowing how to use the understanding. And that is when you get to the final level of feeling it because it is the knowledge of how to use the understanding, how to, how, how to effectively utilize your information. Understanding is information. But then how, and then you fill it with precious things. Now, I like this. I use this for a, um, for a talk I did, but I like it and I just want to play it. I called it the Garden of Eden. And I'm just going to play this for us. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to type what you felt between the first and second pictures. They were both gardens. What went through your body? What went through your mind when you first looked at the first pictures of those beautiful, well-kept garden? And then you started seeing this unkept garden. I just want you to you know, type what, you know, how, what was the transition like for you? That is, you have, that is, is like describing the two, you know, the journey. I'm coming, let me go to the next. The journey I've been talking about. The marriage, the relationship that has all those three levels is that first part that I showed you. 
that beautiful, it's filled with beautiful and precious things. And it is harmonious. It is peaceful. You enjoyed it. It was beautiful. You wanted to stay inside it. But do you know that it took work? Let's go back again. Do you know that it took a lot of work for this garden to be carved like this? It is easy to leave. Let me play this again. It's just looking at it. Do you know the amount of work it took to create this? The amount of work to have this. What the people did to keep this, to maintain this in this state. It, it is unbelievable. But do you know that the other one that, um, let me move forward a bit. It doesn't take much to, to, to keep a place like this. You don't need to do much. Because everything in life goes towards a process of unkempt. Even marriage. Everything in life. Please take note of this. Everything in life goes towards a state of zero entropy. From the day you are born, you begin to die. That is the reality. If you fill up a tire and you leave it and you didn't drive the car, the tire will go flat. If you buy a generator and you never used it, you didn't service it, you didn't start it up, the generator will pack up. It's a process in life because of the law, the, 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 the law of physics. Everything goes towards zero. Marriage also is in that, or obeys that law. A relationship that is not invested in, a relationship that you don't work on, will move towards a state of zero entropy. It will, look, it will move towards that unkept garden. Just don't work on it. Just say, we are married. I don't, we, we don't, I don't need to do any work. We are in love with each other. I love you. you know, we, I did all the work before we got married. I chased you. I did all the painting of my face and doing my hair. I did all of those before we got married. I don't need to do it anymore. You are going to go towards zero entropy. Anything that you don't put in work in. Those gardens, you know, in the US, I see, I see, you know, before we wonder, you come here, the gardens are always done, the walls, the amount of work, every time when the leaves fall, there are some people carrying things to blow it away by the next day. The amount of work it takes to keep the, the street and everything tidy and beautiful is amazing. You want to have a beautiful garden, you spend time initially to create it, and you think that is okay. The amount of work you need to maintain it is more than the amount of work you need you use to create it. Please mark that the amount of work you need, and that's why people that young people that are getting married that are so in love with each other and they think that that is all it takes. I'm so sorry to hear that. Because honestly, you have to rethink the amount of work that it takes to make those gardens beautiful is more than what it took to even plant it. Especially when the garden begins to grow, to keep it beautiful, to keep the pest away, to keep the amount. So if, if you are not ready for that amount of work, it is just awesome to be single, honestly you will be happier because there's nothing as horrible as being, as being married and being unhappy. I tell you, I know. You can be married and unhappy. It's worse than being single and unhappy. You don't know. And so the singles are thinking, I want to, you are, you are better off single and unhappy than married and unhappy. I'm telling you, the two can not be compared. Because the unhappiness of being married and knowing that, you know, this is it. With, in singlehood, they are still, you are still hoping. Now, so that for me creates the foundation of what got man. So I've created a foundation for you of what got man now did in his research. And so this is just a summary of it. So got man did a study and he said that to have a sound marital house, he said, number one, the foundation must be based on cognitive room, love map. Remember what I said, wisdom. I mean, knowledge, understanding. It says love map is information you have about your spouse. I'm just going to read through this, then I'll go through them one by one quickly. 
it says there must be the foundation must be based on cognitive room then built on foundness and admiration then layered with positive sentiment override and then layered and layered and then the top of it the roof is shared meaning creating shared meaning and i'm going to go through this one by one and i said here why a sound marital house what is why am i passionate about this why is this important to me as much as i love you all i love i want for you to have beautiful marriages but i'll be honest with you behind this for me is because children are suffering when you don't have good relationship the next generation are being messed up because of our messes and they are being given a bad orientation and some of them enter into a relationship broken and shattered and they, they get used and abused because of what we do and so for me because i work with a lot of people that are sexually traumatized and abused and all of that research shows that a, a large percentage of these young people are, are from homes that are not comfortable, are from homes that there's abuse, whether the, 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 the parents are abusing each other, fighting, not happy, you know? And so for me, beyond you, beyond me, beyond the commitment that I want a happy marriage, the next generation, and God already said it, see, at this, I should be A, uh, Malachi 215A, 2, 2, 2, but did he not make them one? having a remnant of the spirit and why did he make them one why did god make you one he seeks godly offspring that's why sex is good and i love teaching about sex but the but one of the reason for the oneness is that you know he wants to fill the whole earth with people that are like him with people that carry his nature and it is in you being one and walking in the fullness of the love. And love is not just an emotion. It's good. Emotion is good. You know, I mean, if we don't have emotion, I can't imagine you lying down and having sex with someone. If you have no, you have no feeling for that person, it's going to be difficult. Some, I, I said this once and somebody said, what about um, the commercial sex worker that has sex with 20 people in a day? That is a different thing, you know, they have deadened, do you know how many things they take to deaden themselves and their emotions and all of that in order to do that? We were created for intimacy. We were created for connection. I want to say to you, this is going to be part one because you see, this is my passion. There's so much to say. We are going to have some Marital House part two. They were created, we were created for intimacy. We were created for attachment. When God created us, he created us for intimacy. He wanted to be with us. And, in, and in, in our relationship, we are supposed to show that. And that's why he makes us two, male, female, for that connection and that intimacy. And so it says that the foundation is composed of marital friendship and its ability to create this level, the, co the, 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 the cognitive map. The love map measures the amount of, hold on, let me move this. The love map measures the amount of information you have about your partner, knowing your partner's psychological world and being able to know and feel them. Remember what I said, I said it, your, hus your husband, your wife is your amoeba that you observe under the microscope. It is understanding, it is a work. If nobody else understands that person, I've had people say, everybody, nobody understands them, but my wife understands me, my husband understands me. You know, I see some couple that I'm wondering, how is this person managing? And you see the, the other spouse <laughs> smiling. <laughs> it's like, yes, yeah, so it's difficult, but don't worry, <laughs> I understand him. I understand her because they have entered into the psychological world and you see every human being no matter how wicked or how mean people are every human being wants to be understood do you understand me you want somebody that can understand you 
and you are you are very weak to that person you are kind of um, how would i put it the person that understands you can get things done with you it says then on top of understanding the next thing is fondness and admiration it says no relationship can thrive if we are not fond of each other if you don't admire your spouse if you are getting married to someone you can you don't admire that is not your hero whether it's your wife or your husband when we begin to look down on each other and say what does she who look at i should have married other people look at look at nonsense you cannot that can that is a destroyer you look at your spouse and say nonsense look at look at you must if if you choose that if you've chosen this person and you want to be able to get the best you have to find what to admire remember what i said you 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 buy a plant you have to not try to admire it if you don't not try it for it to bring out fruit to bring out flowers, beautiful flower. To that point of it bringing out beautiful flower, then you, it's difficult to admire. It will just be stem all over the place. And so it says fondness and admiration system reflects the amount and accessibility of respect and affection. You must be affectionate and you have to, there needs to be respect. So if you notice that you are, you are no longer having respect for your spouse, you need to take a, a step back and say for your own good. It's not about that person. A lot of times we, we say it's, it's for my own good. I have to ask myself, what do I need to do in order to see the good in this person? Because if I stop seeing good, I'm, I'm destroying, I'm killing my heart. The person might not have, there's no human being that is 100% bad, honestly. And so if my focus is on the bad, I will not be able to see the good. And so I have to say to myself, there was something good because nobody, especially if nobody forced me in marrying this person, there was something good I saw. How can I build on that good and bring up that good and put that good before me? Because every single one of us have good and not so good. Some people's own are just worse than others. That's, but every single one. And so he said, fondness and admiration and respect and, and, um, and um, yeah, is, and, and found, fondness is very important. Then he said something. He said the couples that he has also seen that state that were happy were couples that turn towards each other rather than turning away. Do you know what that means? That means emotional connection instead of distance. Turning towards means when there are challenges, you turn more towards each other. It's the same thing with God. When, when things have happened and when we turn away, instead of coming to God and when we get angry with God and we turn away from him, it gets worse because you cannot turn away and then things will get better. It's the same way in couple relationship. If you turn away from each other, then you are opening up the room for division then different people will come and take this, this, the gap because you have created a space. And in life, no gap can remain empty. Something must always fill a gap. There's nothing that can stand a gap. There's nothing that can stand in isolation. So when you turn away, you have, what you are doing, you see you are like this, you turn away, you have created a gully. That gully becomes a home for all kinds of things, all kinds of thoughts all kind of, so no matter what, no matter how it hurts you, it's, you know, if you want to keep that relationship, you must turn towards each other, not away from each other. Because in turning towards each other, you are saying you have no, no space, nowhere else to go. You have, it's me and you, we have to sort this out. He now said, the third thing, the fourth thing, it says sentiment override. He now named it positive sentiment override and negative sentiment override. He says positive sentiment override. And I'm, all these are from research. You see, I have laid my foundation from scripture. I'm now talking of what Dr. Gottman did from research. And it just tallies with what I had said. It, that was what, that's what amazed me. It was beautiful. He says that this means that 
relationship that lasts has a lot more positive sentiment override than negative sentiment override. What does that mean? It means that negativity is interpreted as information rather than a personal attack. So when my spouse comes in and squeezes his or her face, I am taking it as an information rather than saying, uh -huh, the squeezing his face because maybe I'm smelling, maybe I have not taken my bath, maybe I'm looking not fine, or maybe you begin to make it into a, you take it personal and because of that, your blood pressure goes up, your, your, your brain, your emotional brain takes over and your reaction is now not a good reaction. Even if, even if it means that, you know, it's okay, but if it doesn't mean that, or if she doesn't mean that, you have interpreted it, you have already reacted in your body. And then your, your emotional part of your brain, and we'll talk more about that in my part two, the impact of the emotional brain on our pro, on, on, on problems. But when you take it as information, it's like, okay, hmm, maybe something has gone wrong in the office today. Maybe he's squeezing his face. Normally he doesn't squeeze his face or she doesn't squeeze her face. You be, remember what I said? Your spouse is your amoeba in your laboratory in which you use the first seven years of marriage understanding because you have chosen that person. That is marriage. You have chosen that person. You, you now have to study the knowing you knew before you got married is knowing zero, 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 one. It's nothing. No matter how much you think you know, the real knowing starts from the day you say, I do. The real knowing. I use this, I say, whatever things are pure, true, honorable, lovely, and virtue, having praise, think on these things. There are, there are times you have to make up your mind and say to yourself, for your own health. And you see, I'm focusing on you now, not only on your spouse, because we will say, ah, and I've been there. Oh, my spouse is nasty, you know, and God says, focus on you. Your reaction is what matters and, is what, and it is what is going to keep you well. You can, you can only manage yourself. You cannot manage another human being, but your, the way you manage yourself will impact how the other human being will eventually react to you. So you only have control of yourself. You don't have control of the other person. And so if you keep sitting down saying, oh, this mean person, oh, that person, what you have to sit is, what do, how do I control and manage myself to get the best out of this other person? And remember, there's no, there, there's no, there's, there's nothing, there's no perfect in life, nothing until the day we die. There's no perfect. There's nothing called perfect. Positive, another way of stating this is that emotional intelligence why recognizes the husband's anger as important information, but does not take it as a personal attack. This also goes vice versa for the emotional intelligent husband. Once you begin to take things as a personal attack, even if it's a personal attack, it's okay. It is what you allow. If, if somebody throws you a banger, you can dodge it. It is what you are allowed to, to, to so, whether, so someone's thought and intention about you, if that is the person's thought and intention, I do not have to take it on me. And I know that it's difficult to say because I'm like, but you are living with that person every day. But the reality is that things shift and we will hear, you know, I will soon stop and, you know, we'll get, we'll hear from our negative sentiment override means that people have a chip on their shoulder. You are hypervigilant, looking for slight attack by your partner. This is also a reflection of the baggage from our family of origin. For some of you, we've been talking about family of origin. Please, I will recommend that you go and watch it because a lot of our reaction in marriages is based on our attachment pattern, our unhealed wounds, our family of origin issues. Please go and watch that um, to understand this better. Watch my presentation on family of origin, attachment patterns. Many of us enter relationship with unhealed wounds, with baggage, 
with, 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 uh, with attachment that is damaged. And as a result of that, our reaction to our spouse is as a result of that. I remember something somebody said to me years back. It, um, it, it, they were married, they had just been married, and there was, um, they didn't have so much money at that time. And um, the couple bought milk, and um, the husband took the tin of milk and used almost everything. And the wife just turned and said, darling, we have two children, we don't have enough money. Why did you use all that milk? And he shouted at her and he had never, and this is a very nice person. He had never shouted that way. He says, never in your life ever tell me that again. And the wife said she was, they were, the, the couples were sharing this with me. The wife said she was taking her back and wondered why. And then that as they had conversation, this true story came out. This husband, this is a family of origin problem. This husband grew up, his mother, his father died at a young age. And so he had to grow up with an uncle. And in the uncle's house, when they give milk, they recount the milk in his tea, maybe about five drops. And so he said to himself, when I grow up, I will take, put as much milk in my tea Nobody will recount milk for me anymore. And he kept on telling himself that. And so when his wife attacked, and not, she didn't attack him, when the wife said, why did you take all that milk? You know what happened? He was transported back to when he was seven years old. And he wasn't seeing his wife, he was seeing his auntie counting milk in his tea. So his reaction was not to his wife, his reaction was to his auntie. The anger, of seven of since seven years old that was unresolved poured out on his wife the anger he didn't even know was there of being of not getting enough because he lost his father of them counting milk drops of milk in his tea and so when she said that word he was transported emotionally to age seven and he reacted but because she was emotionally intelligent, she stepped back and she said, normally my husband is not like this. Something is amiss here. And as she explored it more, the story, the true story came out. And after that, she said, when they buy milk, they will buy two tins of milk, dash him one. And if he likes, he finishes it. And then they will eat because she knows that that is a soft spot. And they had peace and they were sharing this during a meeting we had, during a couple conference. And they were sharing this and laughing about it. The next thing is regulation of conflict. How we regulate conflict. There are three kinds of, two kinds of conflict, perpetual issues and solvable issues. And I'm going to be rounding up this first part, part one, at this point. Very, you know, I, and I'll show you what our part two will look like. The regulation of issues, in relationship, you must know what is solvable and what is perpetual. A lot of times we, we, we sit on perpetual issues. They are not solvable. And because they are not solvable, they make us unhappy. On so, perpetual issues are mostly issues that have to do with personality of the person and from family of origin and all those kinds of things. Have to do with trying to change another human being the way the person is doing certain things. If you don't like your spouse habits before you got married, please, you are not going to like it now that you are married. Those habits you don't like, if it's going to break you, then don't go in. If you're already in, then you have to see it as a perpetual issue and learn how to dance around it. Some perpetual issues might get resolved a bit, but they never go away. Solvable issues are issues that are able to resolve. There are issues that are like, okay, my wife, um, you know, um, um, I, I would like you to cook more. Okay, we can go and get, I, my, life doesn't, my wife doesn't know how to cook. Okay, what do we do? Okay, maybe we need to be ordering food. We don't need to kill ourselves over that. There are things that we can do to be happy. If we have to be paying someone to cook until, and then maybe even arrange for someone to come and teach both of us to learn how to cook in the house so that everybody learns. 
It's solvable. You don't need to sit on it and say, hey, why do I have this person that you don't need to sit on that? It is solvable. There are many, there are different solutions. You can hire someone to come and teach. You can go on YouTube and do lessons. You can, you can hire some, you can be buying cooked foods. If, if that will make you happy, if that will help the relationship. Those are solvable issues. And we can talk more, you know, about that. You know. All right. Perpetual issues are conflicts that never get resolved. Whether couples who manage, whose marriage are going well, are just to perpetual problems. Um, somebody is, Uche, you are muted. Uh, adjust to perpetual problem. I'm sorry, somebody is unmuted. Uche, can you mute yourself? Can you mute yourself, please? I'm trying to mute you. You are not muted. Oh, okay. And I have to throw you out if you don't mute yourself. <clears throat> um... I said, and then solvable problems are situational problems that are not solvable. So I'm going to stop here. And then the next, and then from here, we will, um, part two, we will see what, you know, so our part two will focus on, and that will be next week, how solvable issues are handled, how to honor our dreams, how to create shared meanings, what are the predictors of marital distress, we will look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse and it's going to be amazing. But I'm going to stop there because I think you've gotten so much information. And um, I'm going to then allow our, my couple respond to some of the things that they have heard and just share a little bit about, I know that uh, Mrs. Balami, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Balami, they run, an, uh, they run a ministry for couples. And uh, Mrs. Balami had attended quite a number of this training. Um, there, were, there were times where we've had conversations and there are little gems that she had received from some of those conversations and from other people. And I want them to share some of the gems that they have received from the conversations, the training, and some of the other day from other people that have helped them and then being very real to us. We want you to be real to us. We don't want sugarcoating anything because this is time we need to be real in life. Yes, you know, we need to be real. So um, I welcome you. Um, let me please unmute yourself. And um, I welcome, I'm going to stop um, sharing this so that you can come on. I, I welcome you online and um, thank you. So this is your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We greet you all in Jesus' name. Thank you, Ma. This is an honor. I really appreciate it. I don't know whether you can hear me. Are you hearing me? We can hear you. I just need to see you. Hold on. I'm trying to have you show. Uh, I don't worry. Just continue. I will get you to show soon. Thank you, Ma. This is an honor to me. I really appreciate you. God bless you. You know, the, there's, uh, there's a say in my place that when whatever you throw, there's a probability you may get it back. You know, this is the people that is a saying in my, the, the, the part, some part of um, uh, Nigeria. But if we look at book of Ecclesiastes, it says, cast your bread upon the waters and you may find it again. This is exactly what the, Dr. Eniabi Tobi did. This is her bread that she cast on water years back. You know, I was invited to her program. I have never heard about personality, you know, trait at all. I've never heard of it. And I heard of our free training program and I attended. And as this, as doctor was talking, she was just drawing my husband for me. And you know, she's a psychologist and she, she was looking at me. I didn't even know when she taught, she was teaching and she now break and say, do you have somebody like that? And you know, the whole class laughed and I say, yes, my husband, 
you know. She talked, you know, she taught me something. From that day, I began to study. Talk to us about personality, how do choleric behave, and I could able to know my personality. So I said, God, thank you. To me, is a very big eye opener, and I began to practice what she was teaching. Mm -hmm. She said, the cholerics, this is who they are. They are outspoken. You know, they are driven people. You know, she was just talking, and 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 it was a really thing to me. And honestly, that time I was passing through challenges in the marriage. She said something that marriage is not a bed of roses. It was not. When you see two people and their marriage is good, they have swallowed a lot. My husband will talk of his own. We are going to be real here. I swallow a lot. But with a doctor help in her teachings, opened my eyes. And I began to practice what she was teaching me. Try to know who your spouse is. You know, she opened my eyes. And instead of fighting him, she said, you are not created to fight him. Use, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are supposed to use what you have to complement what he doesn't have. And that is how I began, you know, to complement. When he is hot and displaying the choleric, you know, the lion ah, on me, I calm down. <laughs> you know, she said, we are going, to, let us be real. Well, but, you know, he liked to command. He talked with authority. I asked her a lot of questions that day, and she said, you know where you are coming from. He said, the northern husband, they are like that. And that is that is spoke volume to me. So when my husband was displaying his lion act, the lion act, is it that, that, he, that, that is what he want to do to me? No, that is his making. That is his make. That is how God created him. But I don't know. So the marriage took long. We were, we were managing it. We were suffering, you know, because we didn't know. But now, doctor opened my eye. And I began to, okay, okay, we are all like, so when he's up, she told me that the, the, the mystery of husband and wife, the wife back up. The same thing with me. When he is displaying display in the choleric uh, part of him, I will now sanguine, I will now withdraw, and I will use love. It's not that I was not happy with, let me, we are trying to take, talk uh, to each other now. You know, when, when the marriage was trying to take care of him, I said, did I ever suffer you in sex? And he told me no. Does it mean that I was enjoying the sex that time? Dear brothers and sisters, to know there was a time, you know, the two of us are here. He will have the sex and go. I didn't enjoy it. Why? Because I just said, let him just have it and let me have my peace. There was nothing like enjoyment there because maybe I was, not maybe I may be angry, but men, their anger doesn't touch that part. It, not, it doesn't touch that part at all. <laughs> they get angry, but when they see you naked or anything, they would like to have it. And you, your emotion is up. How can you enjoy it? You will enjoy it. If you use your emotion at that time, according to what doctor taught me, you will, you will enjoy your marriage. Calm down. Whether you are enjoying it or not, just give him and talk about that matter. And that is what I built on. I will allow him to have this said. Was I enjoying it? No. Was, please mark my word. Now it's not like that. Was I enjoying it? No. Let me tell you the truth. Me and you, the two of us are here. My dear sisters, thank God the two of us are working on ourselves. Now, very soon, we will celebrate us, the two of us, we are coming a past to the two of us. Sometimes we will be having the sex and with tears. I am telling you, no, I am not lying. But he would tell me, I guess it's only that I can withdraw at that moment. The two of us, the marriage was hell. At a point, I said, I'm going to quit. I don't want again. Should I die in this marriage? To quit. Not knowing that he will come and talk about his own. Let me say my own. But when you have had a teaching, put it into practice. I was putting what doctor was teaching me. Sometimes I will call her from the US and I say, Ma, this is it. This is it. What can I? And she will tell me, be patient. And this is how you're going to go about it. 
When she tell you be patient, really patient marriage. Patience build marriage. And sometimes we talk too much, more especially with the sanguine. Before the husband will say, one, two, three, my only hand. Doctor taught me how to. Don't be talking too much like this. You know, there are some things she would teach us in the class. Uh, what she was teaching here now, she brought me here to hear from me. Ma, you brought me to teach me something. I was laughing and I say, hey, this woman, she carries something. So we should, we should understand each other in the marriage. We came in with so much baggage the way she say it. And women, we have a lot of work more than men. We have a lot of work more than men. She said we are, we, 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 you know, before our behavior, the way the marriage was, made our children to enter depression. She said it here. And by the time all of us were getting healing, now our children confide in us, was telling us, mommy, what you did before, daddy, what you did before, put us in depression. All of us enter depression. Mm. It's not only the children. He entered depression. I was in depression and low self-esteem. Because I say, nobody believes in me. Mm. But all because we didn't understand each other. And we are not putting into practice what we were learning and what the Bible was saying. Praise the living Jesus. I don't know how many minutes I have. Ma. Thank you. You have, I mean, I'm just sitting down here listening to you. Thank you so much. Let us hear him and then we come back to you again. But thank you. You have, um, you know, I'm so proud of you. And I know that the people that the two of you, I, I, I follow you on Facebook and on Instagram. And even if I don't say anything, I know that the people you are, you are teaching, you know, I'm so happy, you know, because I see that um, you, are, you are transforming life and you are being real because it's time for us thank to you. be real. You are yes. being real. And I thank God for my brother because if he doesn't support you now, you won't be able to say all of this because a lot of men will be like, don't say that so that people, yeah. but yeah. he gets <laughs> sitting beside you, supporting you so that you can say this. You know, because, you know, you said something, there's a change, you know. So, yeah. uh, my brother, can you tell us, uh, let's hear from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon. Probably good morning to some people in a different parts of the world or good, good whichever time we are. Um, it's a privilege to be on this platform. I do not take it for granted. Uh, I've been privileged to meet Dr. Is it once or twice? Once. Once, I think. Once. <laughs> when we came for your mom's program, I think. Yeah, two times now. Yeah, two times, okay. And, uh, uh, but before then, I, I know that uh, uh, you, you have made an impact uh, on on my marriage uh, uh, by the uh, impartations that you have made uh, into the life of my wife, uh, either through classroom teaching or through other uh, means of mentoring and uh, coaching. And uh, I want to use this opportunity to say thank you. Now, Marriage. Um, I think uh, probably where I will start is on the issue of uh, ignorance. Uh, you know, uh, it is said that what you don't know, you don't know. Mm. I think uh, uh, at the point we got married, um, there was a desire to get married, but I am not sure we both understood what it means to be married. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of ignorance. And uh, there were times where uh, I will be in the room, I will be like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? <laughs> um, Unfortunately, uh, my dad uh, died not too long after we got married. And sometimes I will wake up with the feeling of, I will want to ask him and I will remember the man is no longer there. 
So I will now start saying, so who do I talk to? Who do I talk to? Who do I talk to? I pray, I go to the Bible, then I try some other things. It works sometimes, it doesn't work. But I think the number one problem we had was the issue of ignorance. Uh, thank God for, uh, uh, I'm not trying to uh, market my church, but I thank God for this stuff. Uh, when we joined the Desta Christian Center uh, from, from our former church, uh, we got some more teachings that help us to build on whatever little we had learned before, uh, especially on the issue of marriage, on the issue of family, and then now it starts being the issue of, okay, you have this huge file you have carried in your head, that you need to delete the content and replace it with something else. And we know that sort of transformation is not an overnight thing. Uh, the other day I was reading a book and the author said something. He said, maturity is a process. It is not an event. And if you understand the fact that it is a process, then you need to make a provision for the people around you to mature to the level you want. It cannot just be a click of button. And when I reflected that thing, it was just last week I was reading that book. When I reflected that statement on my marriage, which by the grace of God will be, how many years? 24 years, 24 years by December. Yeah, it will be 24 years by December. Uh, when I reflected, I was like, wow, uh, perhaps uh, it is the process of maturity that uh, uh, took a toll on some of uh, our feelings and our emotions. Uh, just as uh, we rightly said here, uh, it's not a bed of roses at all, at all, at all. Uh, just as she said, um, there were times where I've, when I have sat and said, what have I gotten myself into? This woman. I would say, what have I gotten myself into? What is this thing? I, can it never be better than this? Mm. And, I will be, and unfortunately, uh, I am the type that, except the thing is getting out of hand, I don't too quickly run out to start discussing my issues. No. I try to pray about it. I try to look for an answer in the Bible. It's only when it gets like, okay, this one now is blowing out, that I will attempt to talk to one or two of, I've been privileged to have so many pastors around me as a friend. I think I have close to 50 of them. Uh, as friends. I, I don't know how it happened. Some from Redeem, some from Equa, some from Kokin, some from Desta. You know, I have pastors, so I, I am privileged to talk to pastors instead of talking to uh, laymen because uh, sometimes uh, you can take your problem to the wrong place and you get the wrong advice. And instead of getting better, it gets worse. So was it a bed of roses? No. But I think one of the things that has restrained me all the while is I asked myself two questions. I said, if I stop this marriage, what, what sort of uh, image am I giving my wife? I honestly do remove myself from the scene. I say, what image will I give my wife? One. Two, what image will I give my children? I will remove myself. I'll say me, whatever can happen. But because of these two, I will do anything and everything to make sure that this marriage works. Because uh, the Bible says, whatever you will want to be done unto you, do also yes. unto yes. others. So that I will not want my wife and children to be given that bad image. I usually restrain myself. But we thank God that. Honestly, it's the Bible that has done its work in our lives, largely. Amen. Thank you so much for that. 
um, I will come back again to Mrs. Balami and say, um, <clears throat> what, if, what will be the last word you will want to say to people on this platform? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ma, for this privilege. Again, I appreciate you. Honestly, the last word I will leave people here with is no more that is Secondly, the patient and woman. I will talk about the woman. You don't correct your husband with too much time. Can we do that correction so no It pays. It pays. Um, doctor impacted my life more and put of cases. Esther is my doctor. If she can go to her king with prayer and fasting with my my husband also is my king. I pray and I fast sometimes because I want to talk with I have no reason to lie. So let us know more of God and know your onions. Doctor impacted my life so much. I followed her. I followed her up to now. So know your onions. Know your God. Respect this man, no matter how small he is. Give him his due respect. Respect. Men value respect more than sex. Thank you. I Wonderful. Appreciate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to have, if you have any questions for my couple in the house um, before we round up for this part one, and we are going to have part two. Yes, I have um, Kaya raising your hand. Hold on. Let me look for you. Um, so I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Um, Yo. <laughs> to Toyo, 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 madam, my name is Toyo, Toyo C. Toyo. Okay, Toyo C. <laughs> You're pronouncing my name like Toyo the C. <laughs> Toyo C. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, I don't know if it's a, a question. It's, it's actually not a question. It's more of a remark. And first okay. of all, I just wanted to tell Mr. and Mrs. Allow me that you guys look so beautiful and I'm so blessed that you're here. I'm sure everyone else is. You radiate joy. You, ra you radiate harmony. I can see the harmony that you have now and it's a testimony to what God's doing. So thank you so thank much you. for being thank so you. open. The other comment I was going to make was, um, obviously I speak with, uh, I live in UK and you speak with, uh, um, Christian couples who are maybe white or maybe one partner is white or you know they're not the same different uh, backgrounds and uh, I find it that it's it's more um, easier for them to go for counseling and seek help because um, there's always a difference when two people are sh shouting at each other or trying to understand each other but well, sometimes when you bring a third party into it it softens the blow a little bit it lands somewhere yeah. else and not at the other person and that can mm. make a whole world of difference so i see all this when you both people doing that now they guess i was going for counseling and all but when i grew up and my parents had difficulties there was nothing like that don't talk to me and you know it was that kind of thing <laughs> so um i'm so you know so encouraged and so um yeah, just so I'm just grateful to the Lord for both of you that in Thank those you. dark times that you were able to not just be a uh, cultural or whatever it is, you you sought help, you went for it. And I know that, you know, you will continue to do that should anything happen. I just find that so encouraging. So it's okay if, if a white couple tell me, oh yeah, da, 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 and we went for counseling, I'd be like, yeah, of course, that's what you do, you know. But when I, people who look like me say they went for counseling, I'm like, God must be, you must be living and sleeping with the Holy Spirit every single day. <laughs> so, so I am so encouraged. I am single. I'm still trusting the Lord for marriage. And uh, it just gives me hope and joy. So thank you so much. You're such a blessing. Wonderful. Make sure you, I'm going to be having a session for singles. On, um, on, on, so make sure, uh, Toyo, that you attend that. You will love it. Um, okay thank that. you so much. Yes, and that is part of what is for people to learn to ask for help. You don't know it all. Now, you know, as he said something, I have, actually have it in my slide. You said you don't know what you don't know. Very simple. You can be married for 30 years. Yes. You know, and you are not enjoying it because the, what you don't know, you don't know, and you don't do. So it's not even in mm -hmm. the number of years you have been married. 
Yeah. You know, as long as you are doing the same thing wrong, you will continue to do it wrong for the next 30 yes. years. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Very true. Yes. <laughs> you know, so it's not like I've been married. I've had people that is after 30, 40 years of marriage, they learned the right thing and they began to truly enjoy their marriage. Wow. Really yeah. enjoy being with another person and not mm -hmm. just, you know, remember what I said, going, just filling it up with beautiful and precious things, you know, in addition to the children. So yes. thank you so much. It's important if you need counseling, please reach out to us, seek counseling. I mean, but, um, yes. Esther, you can see even with them, she talks so much when it was time for him to talk, you know, it was, she saw, you know, both of them in their different ways sought help. As she said, many oh, times we call me and, and she will say, ma, and you know, and we have conversations. So please seek help, it, you know, right help and it will do you good. Any other question before we round up? Somebody wants to, to say something. Yes, any other question? Okay, so I don't have any more questions. Um, thank you so much. Um, we are going to, um, we have a couple of um, events coming up. Um, thank you once again, Mr. Thank and Mrs. Balami. And um, you, you normally hold um, a, a program, right, for, for, for couples. Um, can, can you just quickly say that, Mrs. Balami, your pro, the program you hold? Okay. Thank you, Ma, again for the privilege. We hold every Friday, 9 a.m. Nigerian time. We hold program for couples and it's very impactful. We target uh, focus on the family and it's being awesome. It's very, very awesome. Even yesterday was my birthday and some of the women that they were, their marriage was very, very sad. They came to celebrate me. They came to work us on, uh, you know, on bed and was telling us what our teaching has uh, been impacting their marriages. So we thank God every Friday. Thank, thank you so much. Wow, I have some of my friends, uh, Mr. Ah, Barista Nia Odunsi. You will be my guest, yourself and Mrs. Odunsi will be my next guest. So go and get yourself ready, very ready to talk, to be real. This is, our program is called Being Real. You know, you know, being real. So <laughs> I can see. <laughs> Barista Nini or Dusi, you are going to be my next couple guest, and you have to be real. I have someone raising, raising um, her hand. Who was that? I have um, one more person. Let me see. Um, <clears throat> is there some? Just unmute yourself. Let me see. Okay, maybe the hand is down. Okay, the hand is the hand is down. Okay. Thanks, Mrs. Ayinde. Oh, Mrs. Aide, how are you, ma'am? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Well, just a little comment. I've been married for, for three years. And uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> My couple are clapping for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I can tell you, it's a uh, it has not been that easy, <laughs> but the grace of God can sustain you till whatever time. I keep on learning every day. Yeah. When we were young, getting ready to marry, like our mothers did not tell us all they needed to tell us. Yeah. I guess because of the polygamous nature they found themselves, it was like, uh, you just have to do everything. There's nothing that benefits you. You just have to be this, you have to be that, and all that, and all that. But sometimes you get tired of all those things. Like, you feel you are being used. Mm. You, you, you don't have that worth as a woman. And if you don't really live by the Bible, it becomes a big deal. Mm. The Bible does not say because she has to submit to you, you have to trod on her. No, she's supposed to be by your side to do things together. 
but um, I'll just use the Nigerian setting as, as an example. You know, they feel you just have to be down there, give you, they give you orders and you have to go by that. Except yes. the Holy Spirit <laughs> working in that man. That's when you get the best. But uh, just as Mrs. Uh, Malami has said, one has to pray so much. You have to be, it's like you have to be on your knees every day, every minute and every second <laughs> of your life. You will be praying for him, praying for your children, your grandchildren, and everything. And uh, that Thank has you. been the only sustenance that I can say. Thank I you. pray that uh, his uh, grace will continue to abound and we'll be able to have all that bliss that we are entitled to in a marriage. We all don't understand when we got in. All the things uh, we get to meet, nobody envisaged that. But the grace of God has been so sufficient and I bless God for that. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And you said something that, and I'm, because of time, I'm going to close on that. Um, and um, I invite you all to please be with me ne next, uh, next week to continue. But you said something that is so important that uh, many, m all of us, including me, you know, I have my story also. We never really knew what it was going to be about when we got in. Nobody really, really taught us. Premarital counseling was, did not really, just taught, told us some little things. And that's why I'm very passionate about marriage. I'm passionate about premarital counseling because of what my own experience also of really understanding what it takes to make marriage marriage and to be happy. You know, you, you don't want to spend 50 years of your life, you know, just managing. And so we are very passionate about premarital counseling. Um, we have training and teaching on premarital counseling. So if you are a pastor, you have a church, you want to know more about the programs we have for, you know, how to, we are, we are actually going to be having a training, training people on how to be able to offer good premarital counseling that is intense, detailed, real you know, real. When couples come to me, when I was still fully into counseling and for premarital counseling, I, and they said they've never fought. The next session, I make them fight. I said, look, we need to be real. You know, there's no, there's, because you are going to fight. So there's no point. Let's be real. Let's do it now. And so we are going to be having sessions. You will learn more about that. And then we have um, assessment also for marriage enrichment. And we'll talk more about that also, you know, what you can do to test, to check the areas of your relationship that you, you need to work on. And just encouraging the younger ones, you know, um, also to be more mindful of the fact that marriage is not a bed of roses. It's not they live happily ever after. As you watch it on TV, you have work to do to make that a reality. And it takes, you know, the two persons you know, um, it, it is better when the two persons are working. One person can work and see result, but it is always better when the two people are working to get the result. That is when it is happier. So thank you again for um, being on this. Next week, we'll see you um, for part two of the San Marital House Theory. Um, we also have Mrs. So Mrs. Olukoga, is there a program? I think there was something we have. Do we have um, that I'm forgetting? Okay, yeah, you've mentioned um, the three programs, um, the one for singles to prepare them to know how ready they are. Which then day is that? The one, um, we're rolling the... Okay, I think that is on, on the 28th. Um, 28th. Yes, and no. then what other program do we have? That's 28th. Of, that, that is one on the 28th. The other one is on the 5th. Um, which is talking about um, to check the strengths and um, weaknesses in, in your marriage than the one for the ministers. And then you, and then we have a training, we have a, a certification training, right? Yes, ma'am. For pastors, for ministers, for those who are working um, with couples. Um, so we're going to train them on um, premarital counseling and how to use the assessments um, um, for their counseling session, which has been proven um, to really be of great worth um, to counselors. 
Wonderful. Thank you for the information. Again, welcome to our program. This is going to go on and on. It's called Being Real. And we're going Thank to you. different couples come on and being real with us and talking to us. Thank so you. Next time, invite other people and, yes. uh, and um, yes. to come in here and to, be, to hear people being real. Thank you. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Mrs. Balami. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank you, Thank you. It's an honor. Thank <laughs> you, Ma. <laughs> yeah.